is Karim Malik. He is the CEO of Biome Grow. And Karim, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, Biome put out a pretty impressive press release that you have uh, executed a supply agreement with the provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the biggest one done to date among all Canadian LPs. Uh, largest in the line of Canada. I think it's in the top four or five in all Canadian LPs. So okay. it, it goes beyond a supply agreement. So when you, we, you hear a lot about supply agreements to market today, and those are, let's say, the LCV or the OCS here in Ontario will ask an LP, right, we need product for this and this month. Give us, that's a supply agreement. And then two months later, they're going to ask for more. This is a 20-year economic agreement with the province of Newfoundland. It's got kilograms in there. It's got five retail locations in there. It's got a payback on CapEx as well. So it's, it's, it goes well beyond your run-of-the-mill supply agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bottom line, what does that mean to the balance sheet in uh, in the next quarter? Sure, we could probably do uh, purely based on this. If we deliver everything, we're going to deliver. It's forty million in revenue initially, hundred million in revenue starting in twenty twenty, another hundred million in revenue starting in twenty twenty one for a company of our size. That's pretty sizable. So, uh, we, as we've talked about in this program before. We're building a different sort of cannabis company, which has a different risk profile. And what I mean by that is, as we finish building our facilities, our goal is to have production sold out for years to come before the facilities are being are finished being constructed. So we're going to be very hmm. both domestically and overseas. So we're going to be sold out for years to come, and that's a very different risk profile than you know putting a hundred half thousand half a million square feet in, Canada, in Ontario, and hoping there's a market for it this year, next year, and maybe the year after. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting idea. Um, I'm wondering what the you know, in terms of the capex relative to selling out for years going forward, there must be some exposure to the concept of the the price of cannabis uh, going down while you're still constructing. And is is there a risk that you know you finish your facility, your supply agreements going out? suddenly need to be adjusted because the price of cannabis has collapsed while you're finishing yeah. your facility. So the uh, supply agreement calls for volume. It doesn't call for pricing per se. There's some price targets in there just so we can get the math figured out in our head and plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're going to have a significant drop in supply in prices on, until there's a supply increase. And that's on 2020 is still my sort of forecast for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, until then, we're going to have some pretty interesting prices. Uh, plus, uh, we're supplying this out of a variety of facilities. So we have a good mixture of greenhouse, indoor and outdoor grow that can uh, meet the demand. So it's a good mixture. But at the end of the day, uh, the facility we're building in Newfoundland, half the production coming out of there is not for Newfoundland. We're oversizing it because because of this package. It's for overseas markets. And uh, mm. those are medical markets. And uh, pricing there is dramatically different. As we mentioned before, we're primarily a medical cannabis company overseas with a bit of recreational in Canada. This is just our first recreational. Okay. Aspect. So does that imply that your facility in Newfoundland is GMP? It will be. It will it's be. under construction, okay. yes. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so what's the total footprint of the Newfoundland facility? It's 168,000 square feet, but it's a very next generation sort of building. It's, um, let me just put it this way, you can probably get about twice as much product out of there than you typically could out of your average 168,000 square feet in Canada. And the way we do that is automation. Automation like you haven't seen in Canada to date. So there's supply shortage going on right now in, in, in Canada. You can blame Health Canada all you want, but the real blame should be with LPs, uh, some of our former clients as well. They've built very rudimentary facilities where you can't get consistent product out the door for you know years to come after you finish a building. Mm. And if you look at any other consumer product out there, uh, it's highly, highly automated. Or any other parts of agriculture, right? Let's say you grow tomatoes or grapes indoors. So is that margins. why there was such a shortage at the Ontario Cannabis Store immediately uh, following legalization on October 17th? Yeah, the, 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 the first couple of days of shortage, the current shortage was for structural reasons. That's going to clean up in the coming weeks. But after it cleans up in people's inventories, inventories that they're sitting on actually work through their retail channels, mm -hmm. there'll be a shortage, a uh, start and stop shortage all through 2019. And that, the reason for that is you hear about a million square feet or half a million square feet. There's no real product or consistency coming out of that square footage anytime soon. And it's just because of the way the facilities are built. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to address that by building a very different sort of uh, cannabis facility, particularly in Newfoundland, where it's highly automated. So when the lights turn on day one, you know, you know what you're getting six months down the line, for example. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what's the extra cost involved with building such a next generation automated it, facility? It's more expensive, but uh, you save dramatically on the OPEX as well. So what's interesting is you can get the quality of an indoor facility but the uh, operating profile of a greenhouse. So for example, if you're targeting a dollar a gram in a greenhouse environment, you can achieve that indoors. You got to spend a bit more upfront to do it. Mm -hmm. and you got to know what you're doing, but you, you still save on the OPEX side of it. So it, it's worth doing. Sure. A lot of the LPs uh, have been suffering from, you know, crop failures yes. as a result of pests. And so I'm curious as to what extent next generation automation actually mitigates against the 
the potential of catastrophic crop failure due to pests or mildews or yeah. or other things? You can do that a few ways. Uh, one way is uh, you engineer the human being out of the equation as much as possible when it comes to growing. We're just dirty animals, aren't we? We are. <laughs> and we're the largest variable when it comes to these systems, right? right. So an LP, if they go from a 50,000 square feet building to a 100,000 square feet building, what they currently do is they double the footprint and they double the head count. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what happens is the uh, the variability in your system suddenly it doesn't go up linearly, it goes up exponentially. So suddenly mm -hmm. the entire 100,000 square feet doesn't work anymore. So right. you gotta relearn it all over again. So the more you can take people out of the equation, the better, plus also having small artisanal sized grow rooms instead of large sea of green uh, grow rooms makes mm -hmm. a dramatic impact in terms of quality and and and, and things uh, going wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're, you're focusing on more modularity? Absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. That also protects you from entire crop loss because exactly. you can get some problem in one room doesn't affect the rest of the place necessarily. Right, and what's interesting is every strain that you grow has a very different secret sauce or uniqueness to it. So beyond just uh, you know lights and, uh, and and HVAC, it's also air pressure and a few other things that you put into it. And and you know you can if you have several crops in a room, it, it just not, you're not going to grow a quality product, which is why the black market still has better quality product. It's a dirtier product, and who knows what the provenance of it is, but it's a higher quality product in terms of percentages also in terms of consistency, because they grow in smaller artisanal size grows, which are easier to manage. Mm -hmm. So you can have a large building, but if you modularize it into smaller, small units, uh, it's easier to manage than, it's, it's a little unintuitive, but it's easier to manage at the end of the day instead of upfront, mm -hmm. and you get quality. And plus, when you add machinery to it, that adds to it more. Okay, so how does that modularity affect cost per unit of production and also ultimately margin? Uh, again, we can get we we can achieve uh, indoor quality at a greenhouse uh, cost point. Okay, it's just really? you've got to know how to do it though. Okay, so so I just not to belittle the point, yeah. but you're telling me that the sea of green wide open concept is exactly as cost effective as the modular concept if it's automated to a certain standard. Yes, if okay. you uh, if we do our job properly, we can hit the same cost points at a higher quality than the sea green. The only advantage of sea green dramatically cheaper to build on on a capex basis. Right. And also your SOPs are probably about 10% as big as they are ours. <laughs> right, so right. There are complications in the process, but if you know what you're doing, okay. uh, it pays off the end of the day. Okay, so looking at the chart here on the NDI yes. uh, for the last three months. So you guys started trading, what was this, back in... Uh, about a week or two before legalization. A week or two before legalization. So, uh, you know, you have not been able to capture the, you know, the broad market uh, in terms of you know real enthusiasm for your company, how are you going to turn this chart around in the uh, quarters and months ahead? No, fair enough. I mean, uh, so it's a bit frustrating because we did announce this. Ma we've announced a few small things since we went public. We're pretty newsy. Uh, we've got some decent coverage as well in terms of following, but we're still a stock that nobody knows about. Right. And if you look at the overall cannabis space, right, most of the oxygen gets sucked out by the top five or six guys. Mm -hmm. The next tier, the tier after that are just, uh, you know, it takes a while to let the market know you exist and what you're doing differently, right? Mm -hmm. So when we announce something like this on Friday, our big Newfoundland agreement, it just looks bizarre for a company of our size to be announcing something so large. So it doesn't make any sense. So it takes a while for us to educate the public that, you know, this is really a legitimate, uh, you know, agreement. It's not something fluff where we're just inventing numbers. These are government numbers sitting in this press release, not ours. Right. Right. So there's that going on. Plus, we've got, this is a table setter for us. We've got uh, several other large things coming before the year's out. So it's just a matter of letting the world know we're a bit of a different uh, cannabis play than uh, what's, what you've seen so far. A different beast. Well, that's Absolutely. why I'm interested to look at the chart. I look at that and go, well, this is either a great opportunity or you know something that's going to take a little bit longer to capture the imagination of the broader space. What are you guys doing in terms of getting the message out to the broader audience? Well, we've got a pretty comprehensive sort of uh, IRPR strategy. We okay. used to be our investment bankers. So right. There's a way to do aftermarket support. Sure. Uh, the problem is we are still like a roughly $100 million market cap, right? And uh, to get uh, you know some people interested, you've got to have larger liquidity. Now, our biggest problem is we've got a small float okay. in terms of uh, you know who can trade or not. So. Liquidity is going up every day. That's going to dramatically change. So when you couple that with some really large announcements coming in the next few weeks, I think it'll pair well together. And just working against the inertia of this uh, unfavorable market right now. Uh, uh, so the way I sort of position ourselves right now is you've got the large guys, which you can make an argument are you know overvalued or undervalued. Uh, what I would like to say is the $500 million and less market cap ca cannabis companies right now, we are the least risky place. If you're looking for the next wave of things that haven't gone on a run yet now, we can get, we can, you can catch that wave with us with considerably less risk than pretty much any of our peers out there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. So is there any ambition then to, you know, capture opportunities elsewhere in the world? I mean, you did mention yes. that you've got uh, ideas for exporting. Do you have actual permits or 
or distribution in any other countries? We got some stuff percolating. So okay. what I'll tell you this way is in, in the next two years, if we're not doing the bulk of our cash flow overseas, uh, something dramatically has gone wrong in our execution. Hmm. So if we're having this conversation, let's say a couple of weeks from now, uh, you'll see quite a bit of our international sort of uh, play. Again, we're doing internationally very differently than everyone else is. Oh, okay. And you'll see why shortly. Interesting. That's intriguing to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, a little bit more optimistic about your guys' chances and opportunity because you guys are investment bankers from the industry. You've had a ringside seat for the unfolding of this whole sector. So I got to think that you guys, your guys' chosen play has got to have some bells and whistles yeah. that other people haven't already I can give you a slight flavor for what it is okay. in case you want a bit of a preview. So if you look at uh, the larger companies that have the bandwidth to go overseas and do something, mm -hmm. uh, they're focused on all the same markets, right. Western Europe, uh, Brazil, Central America, maybe Australia, which are all excellent markets, by the way. But I have no ambition of being the 20th company into, into Germany or the, uh, or I don't know, the seventh or eighth company into, into Costa Rica or, or, or something like that. Uh, we're going where other people are not and being the first in the door. And that gives you certain rights and privileges you wouldn't typically see in these three countries with populations dramatically larger than Canada, right? China? Couldn't tell you right now. <laughs> Sadly, we're public. If we were private, we could have that conversation. Right. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the point is, huh. is yeah, and that's medical, right? Right. And, and, so, and the margins in medical are pretty compelling. Yeah. You've got to build a lot of stuff around it in terms of clinical strategies and ecosystems beyond just you know dropping ship and supplying product mm -hmm. in a country. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been working on it for quite some time and hopefully we can share that information with you shortly. All right, Krim, that's great. We'll leave it there and keep our eyes peeled. But sounds like you're making progress. Thanks for joining us today. Pleasure.